Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad you're all here. And I'll just do one little bit of administrative work. Hopefully, everybody signed in who's actually in the class. You all know how important that is. Um, so I'm just going to get things started. Uh, Bill is introducing me. I'm introducing John Bowers, who's going to be introducing our speaker. So we never do anything easy here in the technology management program. Um, but let me introduce Dr. John Bowers, who many of you might know. He's a wonderful friend to the technology management program. He's also the director of the Institute for Energy Efficiency and a serial entrepreneur. And I'm delighted to welcome John Bowers. Well, thank you, Jill. We, we may actually get to having Matt up here in a second. Uh, so uh, I do want to introduce him. We're very lucky to have him come speak to us today. Matt got his uh, bachelor's degree from MIT and his PhD from uh, Arizona, University of Arizona, which is one of the premier optics programs in, in, in the world. Uh, he now has an ideal job, right? He's part venture capitalist. And like many venture capitalists, he had a number of companies before getting into this role. And, and if you're successful at companies, then, uh, then people like to have you on, uh, as a venture partner. So that's part of his role at IBM. The other part is, it's kind of an ideal job, is to stay in, in research and develop technology. And uh, in particular, IBM is a very forward-looking company, very interested in, in sustainability and a greener planet. So we're very pleased to have you today. So Matt, stand a sec. Should I start over? <laughs> okay. So, so a lot of companies have gotten rid of their research uh, labs or scaled them back. We've done all that we've, we've, we could to keep it going as strong as, as strong as possible and as focused on research as much as possible. It has, it has had to evolve the model, become more aligned with the business than was possible in, uh, in earlier times. Uh, but they've had a very strong commitment to research. A lot, of, a lot of different successes they can point to over the past. Some pretty famous ones you've probably heard of. The, they invented the hard disk drive uh, in IBM. Uh, invented the Fortran programming language, uh, DRAM memory is one of the, uh, the findings, fractal geometry uh, as well, uh, risk uh, computing architectures, uh, a lot of nanotechnology stuff for those that are, that are into that area from stuff with carbon nanotubes, different kinds of devices, uh, some Nobel Prizes in that area, high temperature superconductors, another Nobel Prize area. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of things to point to and a lot of smaller things people haven't heard as much about, but a pretty long standing commitment there. So getting into the, the content now, so uh, I, I think uh, it can be said that the, the world is, is changing in some pretty fundamental ways right now. Uh, and, and one of them is a, a way in particular associated with what's happening with natural resources and the constraints around natural resources. So the demand for natural resources is increasing due to some pretty fundamental drivers associated with global growth and uh, the, the growth of the, uh, the middle class globally. Like the, it says increased urbanization up there, but really it's a growing middle class. Uh, many estimates put the numbers about approaching about uh, you know, 90 to 100 million people per year being added to the middle class. And the middle class consumes a lot more, generates a lot more carbon, needs a lot more materials uh, to function. So that's of concern. And although the numbers are all over the, the, the world, of course, it's almost all associated with India and China. So the, the economic growth of India and China is driving a, a real change in the way uh, the world's resources are being, uh, being used. So we've got uh, demand increasing uh, very significantly because of that. There's also at the same time the supply constraints are getting much more acute. Uh, there's still a lot of natural resources out there, but they're getting harder and harder to find. A lot of the easy oil, for example, and easy, easy, uh, other easy uh, materials out there are, are gone or diminishing rapidly. People are having to go for oil many miles outshore, you know, miles under the water. Uh, doing mining in very remote, forbidding areas, which raises its cost fundamentally. It also raises the cost because nobody wants to go work out there. So the labor costs are going way up. It's very uh, uh, you know, uninteresting and uh, unfun to go out there and do that. So that's fundamentally raising their costs. At the same time, the awareness has come about of the damage to the planet that some of these things can do, or the potential damage. Uh, and the awareness of that is bringing a whole set of different kinds of regulations and other costs associated uh, with pulling out natural resources and using them. And that's causing, a, a, if, you, if you will, a perfect storm in this area. So we really need to be doing things differently than we're doing going forward, or there's going to be a lot of pain. Uh, in one, uh, to kind of say this another way, one can kind of say the environment is becoming material. Uh, and what we mean by that, the reporting requirements that would be mentioned, of course, uh, there's things like the SEC has issued guidance that it's going to start uh, counting 
your exposure to potential climate change risks as a material business risk, meaning you have to describe them and expose them on your, uh, your SEC filings. Now, this, this doesn't mean your actual, risk from, uh, actual risks from climate change, but potential. So, if, you know, how many companies know what happens if sea levels were to rise so many feet? How would that affect your business? Did you have a map of your business as a function of sea levels? If temperatures were to rise, disease rates were to go up. So if this actually gets followed through on, these, you know, that's another example where it's now a material thing. It's not an optional thing. You're going to have to deal with it. Uh, there's also something people sometimes call the Walmart effect, or there's other names for it, uh, where Walmart and IBM as well, as well as other companies, are starting to require their vendors to report on the sustainability characteristics of their, of their products as a condition to be a, to be a vendor. And in some cases, you may get preferential placement of your product. In other cases, if you don't provide the right kind of information, uh, you know, some companies won't even accept your product. So it's not even optional in this case. It's not a cost you can do. If you don't, can't provide that information, you can't get your product uh, in, uh, you know, in, into that, to that customer. Another one is sometimes referred to as CFO as client in a, in a broad sense. Traditionally, people who try to sell sustainability solutions or try to help companies or other kinds of organizations be more sustainable or eco-friendly end up uh, dealing with uh, a, uh, you know, a sustainability officer or if it's, a, if it's in the case of a building, a facilities manager, people that generally have a pretty limited budget and a limited scope of what they can actually pay for and do and the change they can happen. Increasingly, companies that are selling solutions in this space are reporting that they're now meeting with senior operational executives, the CFO or a GM of a business division, and that means that they're seeing the concerns associated with this as fundamental to the operation, uh, the, the competitive operation of their business, not just a nice thing to have or a, a cost center that you just have to manage. It's coming core to the way you operate your business and what you do there uh, has to be balanced with other strategic concerns you have. And the cases, they're not just doing this to be nice, it's because costs associated with energy and natural resources and waste and, and, and so forth uh, are having a big monetary effect on the company. So the cases to, to do these things are based on the business case alone and are even worth redesigning parts of your business to, uh, to adapt to in some cases. So, uh, and also the, the global recognition and action, uh, for a while it seemed like the developing countries were really focused on this and then, sorry, the, uh, the developed countries were focused on this, but the developing countries were not uh, really signing on. They feel they haven't had their growth yet and so, uh, you know, they didn't feel it applied to them, but increasingly you're seeing uh, the developing countries, notably China and India, taking these things seriously, making uh, 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 significant efforts, and even though they're among the world's largest polluters, they're also doing many of the largest green initiatives and, uh, and so forth, uh, and so that's a, that's a big change. So, uh, and, and another kind of indicator of this more broadly, su sustainability as a concept is, is increasingly becoming associated with good business management. So uh, Goldman Sachs, for one, and some of its its, uh, its, uh, its analyst reports recently is advising clients to look at sustainability measures as one measure of the, uh, of the, uh, the, you know, the investment strength of a, of a company. Not so much because it's going to make people like them because they're sustainable, but because it's an indicator of good management. A company that can manage their, sustainable, their sustainability in a consistent uh, way is probably a well-managed company. You know, it's not easy if you say you're going to commit to a 3% decline in, uh, in, uh, in energy usage or carbon emissions uh, you know, per year or some time scale. It, that's going to require hundreds of programs to be managed in certain ways. It requires a certain maturity and skill in, in terms of a managed business. Uh, all, another study showed that during this recent economic downturn, companies that had higher sustainability scores on the various measures that were done before this did better during the downturn, implying again they have a better control in their business and, and their, the resources that they use and they're better able to adapt to the changes associated with the declining environment. So, uh, you know, another uh, uh, point that it's becoming valuable from that perspective. So stepping back, uh, you know, if you look at some of the numbers, if you go in and start analyzing where natural resources are used, where energy is used and so forth, some of the numbers are pretty, pretty startling. So for example, here's just a few numbers on this, and we have some more we'll mention later, but uh, 170 billion is the number uh, estimated of, of, of a kilowatt hours wasted each year by consumers simply to not having information on how much power they're using. Now I'll say actually I've seen a lot of other numbers in this area, and this is actually one of the lower numbers uh, that I've seen, and it's just consumers from insufficient power information. There's actually much more waste associated with other things we'll talk about in, in a few minutes. The 50% water loss is another number uh, that you see, uh, you see about uh, uh, pretty often. About half of water is lost through just leaky pipes and other things like that. Totally wasted, not used. And you hear about all the issues of water shortages. We're throwing away half the water just because of poor, of, uh, of poor infrastructure. And also, you see many, many billions, just in the U.S. alone, uh, many billions of lost hours and billions of lost gallons of gas just associated with uh, you know, sitting, in, sitting in traffic jams. So being able to deal with that would have a huge effect on that. And there's 
and you can find lists of hundreds of, of these kinds of numbers. So the, the waste is, is massive and clear. Now, this is getting back into what we're going to do about this. So you've heard about the smarter planet thing. It, it does appear that something pretty interesting is happening in the capabilities that are out there to be able to deal with some of these issues. And so we've kind of you know, referred to it as this instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent as these components of smarter planet solutions. And by instrumented, we mean that increasingly pieces of equipment out there, physical pieces of infrastructure, you know, physical things increasingly have some kind of sensors on them, uh, some kinds of actuators, and these things are enabled in, the, in a way that they can communicate as well. That's the interconnected part. They also have transmitters on them. There's networks for the data to get where it needs to go. Uh, there's taxonomies and other sort of data management attributes that are uh, uh, increasingly available to let people apply a single context for this kind of data over a broad, uh, uh, you know, over a broad set of situations. And then the intelligence part, once you've got this, is being able to initially just report on it. And that sounds mundane, but uh, you'll see an example later. Simple reporting, uh, simple providing people a, a, just a dashboard of how much energy they're using leads to reductions of an order of 10% or so. So reporting itself is a value. The visualization, then once you can go into predictive analytics, the modeling, how you do decisions, and actually automating some functions, you can do much more, uh, much more uh, optimized and controlled things. And again, these are things some people will say, well, we've always had this. This is always a, a capability, and it's, that's true. But the, number, the thing is that it's much cheaper now. The sensors are cheap enough that they're becoming omnipresent. So they, they are on things. And in fact, many, many of the clients that we deal with tell us the equipment they're using is already instrumented. The data's coming. Sometimes they're just throwing it away. Sometimes they're storing it, but don't know what to do with it. Or they don't have a good data model around it, so it's not stored in any way that's usable. So the data's already there, and that's pretty recent, and it's new. Uh, and customers are coming to us saying, we know there's value in there, how do we use it? And so there is a change happening now, a discontinuity, we believe, that's going to make these kind of solutions really, really be able to uh, explode. And now the good thing and how it links to sustainability is that in almost all cases, you know, smarter, uh, smarter means greener, you know, because smarter is going to mean being more efficient, less waste, and that's going to mean, generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, lower carbon footprint, you know, you know, less use of, of, uh, of scarce resources. So the benefits, uh, you know, we'll give, again, we're going to give some case, case examples later that will gi give some of the benefits. But for example, uh, we did a smart grid project in the Pacific Northwest where we, uh, you know, you know with, with a number of partners. And, and by the way, I'll say I'm going to refer to a number of case studies. If you're interested in more details, all of these are public case studies. If you just type the name of the client or the area with IBM, uh, you know, into a, into, a, into a search engine, you'll come up with a whole bunch of pages describing more details if, if uh, if uh, you're interested in that. So in this one, we did a, a project where instrumented a number of homes, these are residential homes, with a very simple interface where customers could say, do they prefer, you know, their relative preference for comfort as opposed to saving money. And that was going to be translated into some kind of, so something that they don't even see, but a trading on a market with variably, variably priced energy uh, that's going to give them either the, the energy that, that sorry, the uh, temperature that they like or saving money, and, and you know, that would be balanced. And they could change it and override it at, at, at any time they wanted. Uh, and so they would do that to their preference, and there was a variable pricing scheme set up. And uh, at the end of the, the experiment, uh, it turned out there was a 15% reduction in the peak load. Uh, there was also a pretty significant reduction, I don't have the exact number now, in the actual total load uh, used as well. Uh, and consumers saved an average of 10% on their bills. The, uh, you know, the, the utilities were very happy because they didn't have to, have to add any capacity to, you know, to be able to, to, the reason why they want to do it is so they don't have to add capacity as potential loads increase. Uh, and the good thing about this was no one reported any kind of discomfort at all. So in other words, you can get all this and it's basically free because people don't mind doing it. If your temperature goes down by a few degrees for 20 minutes, you're, you don't really even notice it, but it's act in aggregate it's having a big effect. So big reduction there. Uh, we did a smart water engagement in one of our own facilities. Burlington is a fab uh, that we have in, in, uh, uh, on the East Coast. And uh, we did a smart water study and engagement on our own, and we have uh, saving 20, millions of, of 20 million gallons of water per year, which is a you know, $3 million annual savings. That's not a huge number for, for large companies, um, but it's pretty significant. And I'll say there's other case studies that we've done where the savings is that much, but there's another effect that's even more important. So for example, there was one large uh, company uh, that, uh, that we've worked with where they were told they could get no more water at a given site. So they were going to have to either build a new plant, which was going to cost them over a billion dollars, or they were going to have to learn how to make do with the amount of water that they're fixed at at the site. So that's a case even where it's not reflected in the price, but you can't get any more of it. So the, essentially the price becomes infinite after a certain, a certain, certain capacity. Uh, also, uh, uh, we do a lot of intelligent traffic systems. So we did something with the city of Stockholm. 
uh, to make their uh, traffic management more intelligent, doing, you know, reorganizing the public transportation system to make it more, uh, uh, more optimized based on where people go, uh, um, road user charging, where at certain times of the day you get charged more to go in certain, cer certain areas, and these things combine to make 20% reduction uh, in traffic, uh, mis uh, lower emissions by about 12%, and a big, big uptick in the amount of use of uh, public transportation. So st stepping back again now, how does one actually make something s you know, smart? Okay, so uh, we have a, let's take an example. Uh, we can take the case of a, of a building. Now there, there's three kinds of things, three kind of categories of things, if you will, that you might do uh, in the context of a building or really in the context of any kind of a larger piece of infrastructure. You know, one is the uh, efficiency or effectiveness of the underlying equipment. So in here that might be the HVAC, the lighting, the elevator, just making the equipment itself more efficient and effective. That's kind of a traditional engineering kind of job. There's also the design of the overall structure. So in a building case, that might mean using more natural light or, nat or, or, or natural ventilation and so forth. And then the third, and the one we fo focus more on here in terms of this Smarter Planet uh, material, is the, uh, manage the intelligent management of the building. So that's usually some kind of intelligence brought in from the sensors where you're doing things either automatically or providing guidance to people uh, in the building. Now in a, in a building in particular, usually the two, you know, big things that people hit on that, that have the most impact are HVAC and lighting. You know, so in HVAC, uh, you know, again, you can, you can make the equipment more, more efficient. You can be monitoring it automatically uh, so that you can notice when things are detuned and retune it because a detuned system can be enormously more wasteful of energy. Um, you can have the building design better so you're bringing in natural uh, air instead of, uh, uh, you know, when, it's, when it makes sense based on the, the ambient temperature outside. Uh, and then there's the management intelligence, and we'll get into more examples on that later. You can also bring in things that are external, like the weather. Uh, so doing work where we're predicting the weather. Now, of course, no one can predict the weather too far in the distance, but if you actually get a lot of data and apply a lot of computational models to it, you can predict the weather very accurately within the next few hours and in very precise ways in terms of the temperatures and the pressures. And you can use that to pre-optimize the building in terms of vents and where you're feeding, feeding energy in to get more of an uh, uh, optimized management of the, of the building. Now, uh, a broader point, it applies to buildings, but it also applies more broadly, is based on the, the fact that traditionally, in, especially in very asset-intensive applications, like a building or, a, or an oil platform or something like that, the, uh, the information technology is managed separately from the operational or the, the, the uh, technology managing the physical infrastructure. And uh, that has a variety of reasons historically, uh, but the, uh, you know, the physical, the, the physical technology, the operational technology, tends to be uh, systems that are closed, they're, uh, they're not based on standards, uh, they're not very flexible, but they'll have a low latency and they'll be very reliable for their application. The IT tends to be open, very flexible, very easy for third parties to come in and add, add content. Now there's a trend, everyone agrees it's a trend, where in buildings, for sure, uh, building systems are becoming more amenable to IT, uh, to, IT to, to convergence with traditional IT systems. No one knows how long it's going to take. There's a pretty good agreement that's going to happen. And as it does, it opens up the management of the building to all these smarter planet, intelligent kind of applications that we mentioned. And it opens it up to a broader ecosystem where small companies can get formed and come in and start adding value. Uh, it's, not, it's not locked into a single vendor. And this is, again, a broader thing across, it's not just buildings, it's across heavily physical industries. And, and we're seeing this trend move at different rates in different, uh, in different industries. And of course, a building is just one component of a smarter city or a smarter campus. Um, you know, on the, if you go on the, the bottom here, things are starting. At some point, you have natural resources, all the, uh, the, the sources of energy, uh, the raw materials, food, water, uh, through various networks, that gets whether, you know, converted into energy or into usable food or usable, usable products uh, that's distributed somehow to companies or factories. Uh, to residential homes, uh, the, it's metered in some way that lets people determine how much they're uh, they're they're getting or how you manage, uh, you know, to to turn people off or or uh, you know give them variable pricing things of that nature. Uh, there's emerging things like vehicle charging. You know, electrical electric vehicles are uh, uh, kind of a hot item these days. The way you would charge them, no one's really sure how that's going to work yet because the grid can't really handle it. If those were that would grow at any any significant rate. So a lot of things around this. It's a pretty complex interconnected system. Uh, and so as such, you really need to, to deal with that. You need a rich ecosystem of partners. No one vendor can handle all that stuff. So you need to architect the system such that various people can go in, that there's standards, there's interfaces, and so forth. 
uh, and you need to work with people you might normally consider competitors. And one thing, we, we started this thing called the Green Sigma Coalition. You can see the companies in it there. A lot of these companies uh, compete pretty intensely with each other, but they saw that there's so much opportunity in the space right now, so much untapped opportunity and so little adoption that it makes sense for everyone to work together to kind of grow the pie uh, and get things done. And the actual set of partners we work with is much broader than that. That's just a, a, a particular coalition. You need to work with, uh, with, uh, you know, with the universities, uh, VC and startup communities, starting a lot of different groups. Collaboration is really needed in this because it's so complex and there's so many different areas and different sets of skills required. And you know, going into the skills, you know, new kind of skills are, are, are clearly needed. You know? So we want to work with the universities as well on the curricula to see that people are being uh, uh, educated and getting the skills they need to work in these kinds of environments. So you know, we need certainly collaboration with them. But we also need curricula to be developed such that, for example, business people who normally don't study much technology are getting a good understanding of what's possible through this kind of mathematical modeling, the optimization, what kind of new business models are possible, how you might redesign a business based on these things. And likewise, you need the, you know, the, the, the technical folks who maybe are in a different field that normally wouldn't get into some of this this optimization and, and the, you know, the kinds of things you can do with real-time data analysis to get some education in that because we think it's going to be important for almost everything you do. Even if you're designing compressor pumps, that compressor pumps is going to be instrumented, they already are, be instrumented, throwing off a lot of data, real-time data that people are going to use to optimize how it's maintained and when it's maintained and how it's driven and so forth. So I think we, we think this is a thing that's going to permeate a lot of different, uh, a lot of, you know, pretty much almost every different field that's out there. Uh, now, stepping back uh, again a bit, talk about entrepreneurialism. We mentioned the importance of getting smaller companies involved uh, as well, the needing the innovation that tends to come from the, the entrepreneurial you know, spirits that drive people. Uh, so just talk, talk, to talk a minute for that. In the clean tech area, you know, the, the, kind of the, the broad sustainability or, or clean tech area, you know, there's been a pretty substantial venture capital and, and, uh, and startup interest you know, for the last decade or so. Uh, and it was driven by the same kind of things we talked about before. People were seeing that demand was fun fundamentally increasing. It wasn't just a, a blip in a business cycle, but the demand was fundamentally increasing. Environmental concerns were not going to go away, and so there was a good opportunity here. But the early part of that, really through most of the last decade, was pretty much dominated, was pretty much dominated by these very capital-intensive investments, uh, things like solar and wind and so forth. Three, they required a lot of money to get going. Uh, and things that really were mostly technology risk. And this, you know, one way investors look at these things, the degree of technology risk versus market risk. The technology risk is when you uh, don't know if you can even build it and make it work. You have a great idea. You know if you could do it, people would buy it because it's better than anything out there, but you don't know if you can do it. Uh, a market risk is the opposite. Kind of example would be like a social networking company where you know you could do it, you know how much it would cost you to do it, but you don't know if anybody would care. Uh, and so those are kind of the, you know, the two extreme areas. So this was dominated by the capital intensive technology risk plays and mostly on the generation side, you know, things to generate new energy more cleanly. Uh, but recently there's been a, and pretty steadily though, there's been a growing recognition of the potential for what some people call energy efficiency plays, uh, which are basically about just using energy more efficiently. Now, uh, if you look at it, energy efficiency is kind of the world's most perfect renewable energy source. If you can avoid having to make a watt, that's like making a watt you know, with zero carbon footprint and, you know, zero cost and, and, and well, not zero cost, but at low cost. So it's kind of a, it's sense it's a great renewable energy source. Um, and in fact, some, uh, some governments are now granting it the same kind of uh, benefits they give to renewable energy. There's certain credits, you, there's all kind of government incentives and credits you can get for things. They're starting to treat some of that as a renewable energy source, just efficiency programs. And the nice thing for the investment community is that they play more naturally to the kinds of things that VCs, at least in more recent history, are, are much more uh, interested in, which are these IT-based plays. It's an area that, that, that investors, the venture investors, tend to understand and be more comf comfortable with, in aggregate at least. That doesn't apply to everyone, but it's uh, IT-based, it's analytics-based, which, which they like. It tends to be very capital efficient, uh, and as I mentioned before, it's mostly a, mostly a market risk. Um, you, know, you know you can build these things, and, and they're using largely off-the-shelf kinds of technologies. You see the little chart there. Uh, that's the number, that's just from one quarter, just got some data, I think from the yeah, second quarter, 2010. Uh, the axis is the number of funding rounds. So you can see the energy efficiency is dwarfing all the other areas, but you look at the inset to that chart, it's the same ordering of, uh, of areas, but that's the actual amount of money invested. So you can see the inter interesting thing with solar, not, not as many rounds, but way more money. And so you often don't see in some of the news reports you'll read how fast growing is these energy efficiency investments are, because it's not a lot of money, but they don't take a lot of money to get going. You could get a company product to market with you know, $10 million or so, or, or less even, where solar will need you know, something measured in the hundreds. So it's actually growing, but it's, falling, it's a bit under the radar in some of the, you know, some of the, uh, in some of the sources that people, people look at. 
So you might have the next question, because we've said how enormous waste there is, how much money people can save, how great it all is, but you know, why is it so hard to do this and why aren't more people doing it? So consider another example from buildings, because that's a particularly, uh, particularly uh, uh, place where you, in principle you can have an enormous impact. So, uh, so buildings, and this is, this is uh, non-industrial buildings, so not factories, just, just buildings, uh, are about 40% of total energy consumption. Right, so you see the chart there on relative amounts of energy consumption. Buildings is more than transportation. Uh, it's more than, uh, more than industrial applications and so forth. So it's huge. Uh, and it's about 72% of uh, electricity consumption because buildings use electricity a lot more than uh, some of these other sources. And about, see, 14% of the drinkable water amounts. Now, uh, actual engagements that we've done and that others have done that we've talked with show that the estimated savings possible through, through just efficiency initiatives range from 30 to 80%. Okay, so just think of, you know, 40% of the country's energy, and you can save 30 to 80% of it. You know, enormous value there, enormous benefit to the environment. Uh, and in fact, you can get 10 to 15% just from simple monitoring. So if someone just puts a dashboard that shows where you're using energy and where it's, you know, how much you're using, what's consuming it, that tends to result in a, in a, uh, a benefit of 10 to 15%. People call that the Prius effect sometimes because people change their driving habits just seeing, seeing their actual mileage on the... Uh, the, the Prius. So even the lowest estimates you, you see here translate into enormous impact, much more than anyone could credibly claim to be uh, uh, or expect to be getting from you know the various renewable sources that get that often tend to get a lot more uh, a lot more uh, attention. So, and uh, so you see, well, why are people doing this? Maybe it's too expensive. So if you look at uh, that chart, the chart on the lower right of this of the screen, it's not intended that you can read the items, but this is one of these McKinsey abatement curves. Not sure if you've seen these. Uh, one recent uh, um, year-end summary de declared this as one of the most influential pictures of the decade, this, this McKinsey abatement chart. What it is is on the x-axis, you've got the amount of, uh, in this case, um, a carbon emissions saving associated with a given activity, and each, each bar there is an activity. Uh, and that also, by the way, would be roughly, in, roughly the same as the amount of energy savings associated with it. And on the y-axis, that's the cost of it. So those items to the left of the chart are negative cost items, meaning the cost to do them is uh, less than the financial benefit that you receive from them. So you'd say that, you know, why aren't people doing that then? It's negative cost. And so the, you know, the, 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 the economic blogosphere has been discussing all this. And one of the central reasons people like to say is the transaction cost. That companies don't know how to manage the programs to actually do this. Because you can't just go put in new insulation or put in energy efficient windows or put in a monitoring system. You have to, in the real life, in the corporate or the u university world, you have to prepare a proposal, get a committee, all sit down, agree on something. Uh, bring in a bunch of vendors, evaluate proposals, decide what you're going to do, and it, you know, before you know it, it's, you've, you've wasted a lot of time and effort and haven't accomplished anything. Uh, and so companies don't have a systematic way to analyze this, which vendors should they go to, how much benefit will they actually get from a given program, and so forth. So that's one of the, the things that are needed. In fact, if you start looking at the scale of this in a, in a, in a, in a, in a medium-sized or large-sized company, you, know, you can have a given company will have hundreds of potential kinds of projects it could do. Uh, and of hundreds of different projects that will actually be doing it at any given time, each of those projects might be going on in hundreds of different sites within the, com within, within the company. This will be happening in hundreds of different countries, thousands of different states, okay, each with different regulatory regimes and incentive environments that change every month or so. So it's a lot to manage, and so, but it's a natural thing for IT systems to, uh, to, uh, to uh, deal with. And so uh, you, know, you need to be able to have a strategy roadmap, importantly that management capability and solution ecosystem. So this is one thing you're seeing actually a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, innovation in now and a lot of interest in investment in systems that help people do this. Because it's believed if you could lower that transaction cost, there would be a flood of investment in some of these energy efficient uh, solutions and applications. So we're going to go into a few case studies now. It, maybe it's, uh, it's too much to call them case studies, really just short summaries of some uh, different uh, engagements and initiatives and what the results were in this, in this area. And you'll see there's a, a variety of different uh, kinds of examples here. They're not dealing with things people normally think of as sustainability, but they have these kinds of, uh, of uh, very strong effects. Things that just make you more efficient in terms of your supply chain, for example. You don't think of it as a green engagement, but if, you're, if you reduce your, if you increase your supply chain efficiency by 50%, you're probably reducing by 50% your, uh, your carbon footprint associated with one of the most energy consuming parts of your business. So you know, there's a, you'll see the diversity of, uh, of areas here. And again, any of these you can just uh, uh, put a search engine in, uh, type the name of the thing in IBM, and you'll, you'll find a lot of information on it. So one here we have is, is uh, Malta. So the island of Malta, it's a Mediterranean island. Uh, if, you've, if you've not seen it, it's pretty small. Um, they, uh, it's the first 
you know, all smart, gridded, smart grid country uh, out there. So the whole country was equipped with a smart grid that not just a smart electrical grid, but smart water grid. They're a company that has, that, so they're a country that has their uh, water and their electricity kind of intimately intertwined because uh, they, you know, they don't have any fresh water. So all their water comes from desalination, which is run by electricity. And so the water usage is intrinsically linked to, to the electricity usage. And they don't have any natural resources themselves as 100% of the fuel they need to generate electricity is all from imported sources. So they wanted to get a really detailed understanding of how these things uh, interacted together, develop models so the utilities could better predict what to do, better predict what a surge in water demand is going to do to electricity uh, 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 usage and their ability to, you know, to deliver electricity and so forth. Uh, another one there is Hidong Energy. Uh, that's uh, uh, the largest uh, producer uh, in Denmark. And in this case, now, first to give, give context, uh, some people aren't aware that the utilities, this is almost, this is pretty broadly true, utilities, uh, when there's an outage, you know, your power goes out, utilities don't find out about it until, until people call in. The, the networks, the distribution networks are not, are not, can't in any way detect that that's happening, you know, to, to, a, to a large extent. So they had that issue as well, so uh, the, uh, their, their distribution system was equipped with various sensors and actuators, and then when something went down, uh, it's automatically detected. This was now the data coming off this equipment with these sensors too was also used to optimize the management of the equipment. So as equipment looked like it was getting older and out of use and wasn't being as efficient anymore, it could be replaced. Uh, and they can often prevent outages uh, as well just from, you know, from seeing the data coming, you know, coming from, their, from their equipment. And it ended up lessening outage times by 25 to 50 percent and lowering the overall costs uh, pretty substantially as well. Uh, another project here, this Edison project. Edison is a contorted uh, acronym. It's for electric vehicles in a distributed and integrated market using sustainable energy and open networks. And you can tell they really wanted an Edison acronym because it's not really, <laughs> it's not really uh, what the acronym says. But this is, uh, this is uh, an example of trying to uh, implement electric vehicles uh, in, in Denmark. So they actually took a small, very small part of the country and they're doing a, a, a pilot where you're, uh, you're trying to relate wind energy to use that with electric vehicles in a way that's kind of mutually synergistic. So, you know, one of the things, just, just to step back for a second, with, with electric vehicles, there's a lot of interest in them. They can have a pretty strong effect in reducing uh, carbon footprints, reducing costs for energy, and, and so forth. And for a variety of reasons, they're very beneficial. Um, but the current grid can't handle them if they were adopted in any significant way. If everyone came home, for, if even a small percentage of people had them and came home and, and started to try to charge them after work, the surge in demand would coincide with the other surge in demand and the, you know, you'd, have, you know, you'd have blackout. So people are really doing a lot of thinking about how, how you're going to do this, this kind of charging. So they're looking at systems, they're studying the actual behavior patterns of how they're used and can you use, put up wind energy to specifically meant to be charging these and in cases where there's not enough energy, you would actually be taking energy out of the cars and putting it back into the, the grid. Now this, there's some social, issue, social issues with that. People spend a lot of money on an electric car, they don't want to be powering the grid with it. Um, but they're working you know, on studying these issues and seeing how they could be used and how often it would need to flow back and so forth. Um, another one here, the Smart Bay in, in Galway. It's a, a bay in Ireland. This is kind of a, a more uh, um, ecologically based example. Uh, the, the, the bay there where there, there's sensors. So the, it, it was a very manual process before, but it was equipped with sensors to detect all the wave conditions, the status of the marine life, and the pollution levels in the bay. And it's all available, it's all integrated, analysis and modeling being done on it, available openly on a website. Fishermen use it to, to, to do what they need to do to see what the fishing conditions would be, both in terms of the water and marine life. The pollution, which is, it's, they're very sensitive to pollution here, that can be monitored in a real-time basis problems can be identified early, and so forth. So it's taken this enormous manual and slow and non-transparent process into something that's much more beneficial. Um, the, in the middle there, the San Francisco uh, Public Utilities Commission. Uh, this was kind of an asset management kind of engagement. This is the wastewater treatment, basically. They've got thousands of miles of, of pipelines, water pipelines. They process between 100 million and 400 million gallons of water a day, uh, and enormous waste, you know, leaks, the equipment's breaking, uh, the, so sometimes it's not working and the pollution is getting into the environment. So this system has, again, all the key assets, the wastewater treatment equipment, uh, different flow, the, the different, different areas where the water is flowing, all instrumented and connected and being analyzed. And, uh, you know, there's the savings, there's a, a massive saving in maintenance <coughs> operations because you're identifying something's going to go wrong with the equipment before it does, so, so it's not letting you know, bad stuff get into the water. Uh, for some time before you notice the problem. You're able to do predictive, uh, um, uh, you know, predictive maintenance, so you fix things before they break and, and so on. Um, Singapore, this is an intelligent traffic uh, system case. Singapore, if you're not uh, uh, 
uh, seen it ever. It's one of the sort of smartest cities around, if you will, in terms of the smart city, city concept. Uh, and this deals with their traffic. There's a variety of things you can do to, to lessen uh, congestion. Things like road user charging. Again, you charge based on, uh, on, uh, uh, based on the traffic at a given time or even on a, a given time of day on a given route to suggest other routes. You provide people with data from this advanced modeling. It's actually a pretty challenging thing to model traffic. It's a pretty complex system, but you know, we've done things like that. You can give people predictions of what traffic will be so they can make more intelligent decisions about when and where they'll go. Uh, you can uh, make traffic lighting more intelligent. We all know traffic lights are pretty dumb. I, you know, we, we all wonder why that hasn't been intelligent uh, <laughs> uh, earlier. Um, and there's a variety of things you can do. So we've done a, a number of things in Singapore, and uh, you know, they've seen pretty enormous uh, reductions in the, the, uh, the emissions and the, uh, the, the delay times associated with traffic. Uh, McKesson, th these are the McKesson and Costco are two supply chain related examples. McKesson is the, 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 at least in North, Ameri the North America, the largest medical products distributor. And they have a pretty sophisticated, elaborate supply chain. And we went and did work with them, developed this common data model across all of their supply chain, and let them do something that sounds obvious, but most companies don't do, this integrated analytics, where you don't optimize each individual function you do, but you optimize across functions. Again, it sounds obvious, but it's, pr it's pretty rarely done. And uh, by doing that, they're able to uh, get pretty dramatic improvements in their supply chain, uh, their uh, 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 supply chain management. I can't give the exact numbers here now, but it's a pretty significant improvement. Costco, uh, you're, you're probably familiar with, one of the world's largest uh, sort of end-to-end -end conglomerates for uh, you know, shipping, and shipping and distribution, and uh, worked with them, analyzed their whole end-to-end -end supply chain from, the, from the, where, the, where the, uh, the vendors they have are going to, or the customers that they're shipping to, the different distribution centers and so forth. And just from doing, doing that kind of analysis, we're able to reduce the number of distribution centers they have from 100 down to 40. Presenting 100, it's preventing 100,000 tons of carbon from going into the environment each year. And you can imagine what the cost benefit is, going, from, going down from 100 to 40 di different distribution centers. And one of the nice things, too, with a lot of these examples, once you instrument and develop this interconnected infrastructure for a given system someone has, it becomes uh, a, a much lower activation barrier to be able to do additional improvements later. So once you get that in place, the additional improvements are going to have a much higher return on investment. This last one's a bit different, the, uh, the UK, uh, UK retailer. Um, packaging, you know, we all know there's uh, uh, things often come with what we would think is too much packaging. Uh, and you know, having run a consumer products company myself once for a while, the packaging can be a significant fraction of the total cost of the product. And we know that the customers don't really care, but the data show it makes a big difference uh, sometimes whether they buy or not. And also people worry about whether things will break. So we did a, uh, 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 an analysis of, the, of, the, of their packaging, of the, from the materials that are in the packaging, from the way things are positioned, to the actual likelihood something will break, so you see if the packaging is, is you know, too much or too little, the kind of pr the protective packaging, and uh, able to reduce the, the cost per unit weight, 37%, the total net packaging weight by 25%, and taking up less space so you can ship it with less gasoline and less, and, and less fuel. So pretty significant, you know, significant impact associated with that. Um, so the final... Uh, the, 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 you know, the final uh, slide here, um, to, just to, maybe I'll just step back and kind of summarize what we're saying. You know, so from the beginning we said there's, we're living in a world where most people would agree that the environment is becoming more and more constrained. You know, natural resources are getting, are getting harder and harder to get. Um, the demand is going up at the same time. And so we need to be doing something different. Uh, we put forward the view that these, what we're calling smarter planet systems, other people are, you know, have different names for them, but it's these intelligent, interconnected, uh, and instrumented systems, that that provides one way to be able to, or a major way to be able to, to deal with these, the constrained environment that we're increasingly uh, living in. Um, and that the other point I wanted to leave you with is that the ways for dealing with it aren't always obvious. It's not just about, let's do solar energy, okay? That you can get enormous savings from things you wouldn't normally think of as green or sustainable. You know, just making a business process more efficient, you know? Uh, just uh, if you can make something efficient and not have to have so many people involved in a particular process, it would take up less space in the building and sit with how much energy buildings are used. Uh, if you can avoid the use of paper by making things more electronic. If people work at home more. So mobility technologies, being able to work at home, better collaboration technologies, uh, you know, save enormous amounts of energy. If you don't have to fly to a meeting, for example, the redu reduction in carbon footprint associated with that. So there's a, a lot of... Uh, and then, of course, we mentioned the, uh, you know, the supply chain issue. So a lot of things just from business efficiency have a huge effect on sustainability. And that's kind of one of the key things, that efficiency, business efficiency and cost efficiency very often align, almost always align with, uh, you know, with ecological efficiency. It's not always true, but it's often true. 
Uh, and that's about all the, uh, the prepared content we have. Okay, that was fantastic. I know I learned a ton. So I think we're going to start with some questions. And are you going to bring the microphone over? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Uh, could you briefly elaborate on the initial and primary steps taken to transform an unsustainable project to a sustainable one? I, Sorry, I, I think you went into the proposals for creating a sustainable project. Could you maybe elaborate on the proposals and what these proposals consist of? For which, which kind of project? What was that? You said proposal for some, for which kind of project? A sustainable project. A single project? Sustainable. Oh, sustainable project, yeah. okay. You so I'm not sure I understand the question? Uh, could you just describe the proposal uh, for creating a sustainable project? Proposal for creating a sustainable project. Yeah, not I think you on. mentioned uh, during the process of uh, sustainability that there's usually a committee and there's a proposal. Oh, okay, okay. so I'll, well, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I was kind of doing a little bit of a parody there, so kind of, kind of exaggerating it, but you know, when a, if, a, if a company decides that they want to, you know, a larger company wants to do something to reduce its, its, its carbon emissions, so they're going to have to still study what all the options are, you know, and then once they then decide the kind of thing they want to do, it's going to differ geographically across their company, you know, right, if you your, your site in Arizona might want to put solar, you're not going to put that in your site in Pacific Northwest, you do something else there. So it's going to vary widely across the company, so it's, it's complex from that perspective. Uh, you're going to have to make, mo somehow model the effects of what the impact's going to be, because you're probably publicly committing to a given reduction amount. So for example, you're going to put in an automatic lighting system, you might say, well, the, you know, the lights will turn off when no one's there and people aren't there this often, or maybe we'll put in LED lights that's going to reduce energy this much, you, you calculate it, but then you'll find people actually bring in incandescent lights from home and plug them in the wall. And it does. So you actually need real data from the real world to say how much these things exist. So you have to work with consultants to do that. And so uh, these kind of, uh, and that you'd have to form a committee, you're going to have to get bids, get multiple vendors in, you have to research which vendors to get in, multiple vendors and so on. So it's a complicated process. This is common in any kind of procurement system in a, in a, in a corporation. Uh, and that's why people often have tools they've built to help do this. And so I was, I was just trying to make the point with that, that there is an emerging, a lot of people have seen uh, that uh, this is something, or believe they're working, they've started companies and they've gotten investment from some, some pretty credible firms based on the assumption that's what's holding back massive spending in some of these efficiency areas is the fact that this, prog this kind of process, which I kind of parodied there, those, this kind of a, is, uh, is um, too complex and too costly, and with the right IT tools that are already kind of common in other areas, one could, uh, you know, one could reduce that cost and, and unleash those kind of projects. Okay, other questions? Okay, so I had one, two questions. The first one's really quick. I just want you to name a process. Um, is there a particular algorithm that you can use to speed up your data collection process? Because it seems like you have a lot of variables. You're not sure which one is the most important variable. So that's going to affect how well you can design your experiment. But to make it harder, you need to take a lot of data over a wide population. Is, is there a particular like name for an algorithm that you would use to do that? An algorithm to speed up the data collection? Yeah. Like DOE or some like design of experiments or something. Oh, like I should say, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's still an art to do that. You know, this, at this point, at this point, there's, there's more data than people can understand. Oh, okay. Typically. Right, so you don't have so, that problem yet. Right, because typically okay. the, the, the equipment has gotten instrumented and it's putting oh, off data. that's the instrument problem. Oh, what's that? So, so that solves, that's, you've got the instrumentation and the other ends instrument is the one that's solved. Right. For you. At this point, there's more data than, pe there tends to be more data than people know what to do. What we hear from clients most often is, I've got all this data, it's sitting there, I believe there's probably value in there for making my business run better, but I don't know what it's telling me, what it's trying okay. to tell me. Okay. So that's the problem. So, uh, and that's kind okay. of an art to figure out how to look at that and see what's important, because it's an enormous amount of data. All right. It, the other question I had is, um, it seems like most people say, oh, I really want to save the environment, but then don't necessarily act in accord with that, right? Like, yeah. it might be harder to get someone to turn their lights off at night than to get them to drive less far or something like that. Because you can always just raise the price of gas and then people quit driving. Um, so I was looking at this and it seems like the three big players are energy, um, CO2 reduction, 
because those are sort of popular in the press. And then I was thinking maybe water is another really important player. Yeah. But other than like in places like California or you know like inland China or something like that, it doesn't seem like there's much force on people to want to reduce their water usage. Like how do you get people in Mississippi to use less water? Right. Yeah, so that's, that's the, classic, the classic problem. And, and these are things I think in, you know, economists often refer to these kind of things as, as externalities, you know, where there's a, you know, because first you ask, why do you want to reduce water? You know, the reason is because you think there's a social cost to it that's pretty substantial, using too much water, but it's not really reflected in the price, right? Because water doesn't cost that much. You don't care if you flush the toilet more times than you need or do an extra load of wash. Um, and that's a case where, so that's, that's where people use that as an argument where there needs to be some additional cost brought into it through a tax or some other kind of scheme uh, to address that, that, you know, that, that externality. So I think, I think your observation is, is right on. Our experiences as well, and you know, my, my personal experience, people do often talk about wanting to, 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 to do these things like you're saying, and, s and some people do. There are people that are very earnest and very, very passionate about it. But statistically, on average, in aggregate, people do what's, they're, they're driven by other factors, either their own pocketbook or their own convenience uh, and so on. And unless that pain gets to be substantial enough, like gas prices get to that point where people have started, uh, you know, commuting a bit more. So when it reaches a certain point, people people do that. But so one of the things we, in, in the from the business perspective on this, is we say if you're going to make an offering on it, it's got to you got to do it on the economics, not based on people's uh, desire to, to to do well. Now those desires can be translated into economics through various kinds of you know taxing schemes and so I forth. Just bring up an example. Um, you mentioned the smart pay program. Yeah. Um, its advantage is it's sort of a very holistic approach. You have to affect a whole bunch of variables, right? right. You have to affect water quality, heat loss, whatever. Um, but it, that one doesn't seem very, um, that one seems harder to sell to a single business. Right. Like how do you sell that to your water treatment plant when yeah, they're only going to make 10% profit on it? Right. Because, you know, it's a small right, variable. So, so some of these things you see being done to, to governments and they're doing it it's coming out of another budget. They already had all these. Sometimes, and sometimes they can actually lower cost. I'm not sure if it did in that case or not, because it's being done manually now, which itself is very expensive. Uh, but also, you know, you'll find sometimes governments do pilots and things like that. It was good for tourism too. They, you know, there's a website we can go and find out what the conditions are, and that's good for tourism. So they, they had a more, uh, you know, a nuanced business case for that. And being a government entity, it's a bit different than when you go to a business where they're going to really look at the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the the business case for it, the return on investment. Yeah. Okay, great yeah. questions. Who else has one? All right, this is like a three-part question. So, uh, first of all, is uh, does IBM get access to the entire operation and processes of a company, and are they pretty open to that generally? Yeah, so that that's a case-by-case -case basis, and you know, in in almost every case I mentioned there, we work with a number of partners, uh, and so. Uh, and that's in part because of the skills. You know, no one company has the skills to do all these different things. You know, if, you know for example, we don't make sensors uh, at all. We do have some technology in here. We don't make that. There's a lot of things we don't do that are in, in these engagements. Other times, it's just because of the relationship. Maybe there's something we could do, but another company is the one that sort of got, you know, conceived of a particular kind of a project, got the customer buy-in, and they just bring us in to help with something that they can't do themselves. And so it varies on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, whether you get all the data, that also varies on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, companies, uh, some companies are very uh, um, sensitive about where their data goes. Um, other ones, you know, we, we do a lot of outsourced business process, so we already have a lot of sensitive data for companies. If you can provide the right security guarantees for them around it, they'll do that. So that's really a case-by-case -case basis. But we can often get very, very sensitive data if you give the right guarantees. Um, you know, that's... Uh, and I guess the last question would be, are, can small businesses actually benefit from what IBM does, would you say? Oh, yeah. So we have, um, you know, we mentioned the, the importance of the ecosystem in here. We, we have in the, in, the, in fact, the group that, I, that I'm, I'm uh, uh, a part of uh, is specifically formed to help IBM better engage with the startup communities. That's one example of small business. We also have entire uh, um, groups of people, very substantial large groups of people, specifically dedicated to interfacing with small and medium-sized business community. So there's a uh, you know, big active effort to, uh, to do that. And a lot of these cases, again, some of the, especially on the startup case, there's a lot of really innovative uh, capabilities um, that, we, uh, that you can access through that. And in fact, that often feeds the acquisition pipeline as well, a company that you partner with and do a lot with, you know, you, you eventually might decide to buy. So we, we see a lot of value in the small companies there, for sure. 
Okay, let's get from, did anyone over here? Okay, Jim. I was wondering if you could comment just a bit on uh, what kind of help would you need from policymakers to further accelerate the transition to a sustainable infrastructure? What kind of uh, bills or what kind of movement or what kind of help do you need to really bring this about in a, even faster than it's going right now? Yeah. So that's interesting. And, and uh, th the nice thing is you know, there's enough, enough payback and enough of a business case for a lot of these things that you don't really need um, help you know, to be able to, to, to sell a lot of these solutions in, t in today's environments. The current co prices for energy and the anticipated rises in energy going forward are pretty, pretty motivating to do that. So I think more from that, you know, I mean, certainly if someone put a significant, you know, price on carbon, that would, that would drive a lot of business. It's not needed to do solutions in this area, and it might not even drive the solutions in the area that will have the most impact. It will drive, you know, because you're, you know, you have to be careful when you, when you do these policy-directed uh, solutions. I think one of the key things I think you'd want from policymakers would be, would be clarity on what they're going to do, and uh, uh, so there's not uncertainty, because that's what, prevents investment sometimes when you don't know if you think they might be putting a price on carbon, then should you invest in this area or that area? Uh, so I think clarity is probably the best thing that they could, they could, they could do. Okay, let's maybe one or two more questions. Do you think that uh, it's ethical for corporations to increase prices on products that are more sustainable, sustainable towards the planet? Oh, sorry, could you, could, could you repeat the question? Do you think it's ethical for corporations to increase pro uh, prices on products that are more sustainable to lower the Is planet? it ethical to increase prices on? Well, I think um, you know companies companies exist uh, you know because they're able to make to make profits. They don't make profits. The company will go out of, will go out of business ultimately. So companies need to make to make profits, um, and the companies usually set their prices by what the what the market will 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 pay for it. So. Um, I just feel that uh, corporations are putting pressure on the consumers to uh, turn green, but why even make inefficient models of products? Why not just make a, like yeah. one efficient model, period, yeah. and everybody will turn green from I mean, this moment so, on? So, you know, with in, a, in a competitive market, and if it's, not, if it's not competitive, it's different. In a competitive market, if something, you know, is fundamentally cheaper to make, its price will be, you know, will be, will be lower. So if the price is higher, it's probably because that's, you know, in most cases, these sustainable uh, products that people make, and I'm, I'm not sure what, which kind you're talking about, we should get specific probably, but some of these, uh, if it's something made with a biodegradable polymer, for example, uh, its cost is probably higher. And so, you know, it needs to, they need to charge more for it uh, or there won't be a sustainable business model to make it, you know. And if customers aren't willing to pay the higher price for it, then, then it's not really that valuable to them. And would be, that would be the standard economic argument for it at least. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. And if question. you want to change oh, that, the one way to alter that would be through a government intervention. Then. There could be some kind of a subsidy or some kind of a, but I mean it's, you know, companies, you know, companies operate within the, you know, the normal economic environment. Okay, and one more question. Anybody has one? Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.